Okay, I think I'm going to kick off at that point. It's great so many of you can, can join us. It's good to see uh, some old friends. You can take that whichever way you want on the attendees list. And just so many people engaged and interested. Just really pleased you can join us on behalf of Cumbria Woodlands. Cumbria Woodlands is a not-for-profit looking after and encouraging the management and creation of new woodlands in Cumbria. And I'm, I'm really, really pleased to welcome uh, Sarah Green from Forest Research to speak to us today. Uh, I'll not keep you long. It's really about the good news for juniper, what natural resistance there is out there. You know, the juniper woodlands of Cumbria, England and the UK, absolutely vital resource, which I think are often overlooked. So the good news, how we can be protected by natural resistance from Phytophthora ostracidae has to be good. The bad news about how it's spread by nurseries and then moving on to the biosecurity implications, what we as a profession can do to limit and restrict the spread of this. So without further ado, I will hand over to Sarah. Before doing that, I'll say, we are going to stop for questions after around about 15 minutes. So when we've covered off natural resistance, we will break for questions. Um, we've got everybody on mute at the moment. Um, if you do have a question, please do use the uh, webinar chat function. And also when it comes to time for questioning, please do the use the raise your hand function as well so that we can then um, bring you to life, so to speak. Um, and we can hear your question. Okay, have I forgotten anything else, Carrie? Oh, no, you're good to go. Great, so with that, I'll hand over to you, Sarah. Thanks ever so much. Okay, thank you very much. Very exciting to have so many people here interested in Juniper uh, attending on this sort of really hot afternoon. I have to say it's actually gonna be 29 degrees here on the west coast of Scotland, which is unprecedented. So uh, yeah, here I am, windows closed and noise reduction. So yeah, so the first, as Neville said, I'm going to start off by talking about the natural resistance and what we've done looking for natural resistance in juniper populations. And I just want to say this photograph here sort of illustrates this lone healthy tree on an otherwise very heavily infected site in Perthshire, perhaps representing the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Anyway, that's what I like to think. So just, I'm going to start with a little background on Phytophthora ostracedri. Um, as you all know, it's an emerging invasive pathogen. And we believe it was probably first introduced to the UK in the 1990s, possibly earlier. Uh, and it's now widespread in juniper populations in Northern Britain. And looking at these two photographs here, the top photograph, uh, well, these both photographs are taken from our Glen Artney triple uh, SI site in Perthshire in Scotland and the top photograph was taken in 1979 before the pathogen was introduced to the site and the lower photograph was taken from a similar perspective on the site in 2015 just demonstrating the um, the damage that this pathogen has, has wrought on that site. So the only other place in the world where Phytophthora ostracedri is known to be causing a forest disease epidemic is in southern Argentina and where it's infecting uh, the native Chilean cedar, Ostracedrus chilensis. And this photograph was taken, uh, I was happy enough to take it when I visited in 2014, and this is uh, in Patagonia. Um, and it's in a location called Victoria Island, uh, where the dieback was thought to have started back in the 1940s. And you can see all the dead and dying trees are Ostracedrus chilensis. Interestingly, Victoria Island was the location of a number of nurseries. There were quite a bit of importation of um, exotic plants and plantings on this island and forestry nurseries which uh, they believe may have been responsible. They believe that the disease started here and then the forestry nurseries, the planting out of stock raised on this infected island could well have been res partly responsible for the widespread um, spread of the pathogen uh, across Patagonia. So we also know, looking at the genetics of the pathogen, that there's the, the strain of, of Phytophthora ostracedri in Argentina is genetically and morphologically distinct from the strain of Phytophthora ostracedri that we have in the UK. So we know that what we have here has not come directly from Argentina, but the genetic analysis also shows that both of these strains almost certainly arose from the same source population 
which is located somewhere in the world, we don't know yet where. But that one strain came out from there and ended up in Argentina, and one strain, another strain, has come out and ended up in the UK. Obviously, we're very interested to know where this source population could be. So, um, again, the work that we have done so far shows that a, a single genetic strain of the pathogen has spread across, across Britain. Um, that's not to say that there are some, some genetic differences, but looking at a range of different genes which are conserved, we can see that they're all identical across all the isolates we have from this pathogen in Britain. So that leads us to believe that it has been a single strain introduced, although it could be multiple introductions. Like most Phytophthora, well like all Phytophthora, Phytophthora oshocedri is born in water and in soil. This is uh, one reason why they proliferate so well in nurseries. And the photograph labelled A is a thick walled resting spore called an oospore. And Phytophthora oshocedri produces these oospores very abundantly. Uh, and we believe this is what enables it to survive for potentially long periods in soil and other infected debris and root debris. The photograph labelled B, the oval shape as a, as a sporangium, um, and this is the spore sac, and inside that oval shape, these free-swimming zoospores are produced, and they're released from the sporangium, and this is what enables Phytophthoras to spread in water, and that's also why water is very effective spreader of Phytophthora ostracedri, so stream water and also soil water and within wet flushes, this is where you tend to, to see the disease on sites. So the pathogen infects the roots and the stems of juniper and if you look in the photograph labelled C, this was taken of the lower stem of a juniper that was infected and I've cut away the outer bark and you can see this sort of tongue of infection that's a, color, a cinnamon brown colour uh, coming up from the base of the, of the tree and you can see the white arrow points to the leading margin of that lesion. So this is where the pathogen infects the roots, it travels up part the way up the stem, it then girdles the stem and it essentially kills trees by starving them of water and nutrients. And you can see the photograph labelled D, the tree has essentially desiccated because it cannot obtain water. But the pathogen is active down in the roots, predominantly. So we know, looking at the sites, um, and we first discovered Phytophthora ostracedri and juniper in 2011 in the UK, and looking at sites, we can also see that it causes very high levels of mortality. Um, however, at some sites, we also see individuals that remain healthy despite being completely surrounded by long dead trees. So the question we asked was, are these, have these simply escaped disease or are these individual junipers naturally resistant to the pathogen? So we did a study uh, where we tested this hypothesis that these survivor trees in high mortality stands have natural resistance to Phytophthora ostracedri. So to do this, in 2015, we collected cuttings from survivor trees at two highly infected juniper populations. And one of them was in Glen Artney, the site I showed you earlier, that's in Perthshire in Scotland. And I found 20 such trees that fit the category of being very healthy but completely surrounded by, by dead trees. I also visited Horswater in Cumbria and this site I found seven trees that fitted the, the, the category. Interestingly both of these sites had actually been reported to us back in 2004 as having widespread dieback of juniper and we went to the site back then and, and both sites and had a look and um, didn't identify Phytophthora ostracedri mainly because we were we were not carrying out molecular techniques at that time. We were trying traditional isolation methods, and this pathogen is extremely slow growing. It's very very difficult to isolate, and in fact, it wasn't even first described until 2007 in Patagonia, despite disease being around since clearly around in the area since the 1940s and 1950s. So that just shows how difficult it is to get in. So it was the advent of molecular techniques that have enabled us to identify the causal agent at these sites. But we do believe that these two sites were possibly one of the two earliest sites to show disease. So I took the cuttings back to our nursery manager at our Forest Research Northern Research Station, and that's NRS, that's what NRS stands for. And Dave is really good at rooting cuttings of juniper. And this resulted in a trial of juniper clones with putative resistance to Phytophthora ostracedri. 
And these were obviously started off in a greenhouse and then they were subsequently grown on outside at our research station for four years. So in 2019 and 2020, I inoculated this clonal trial with phytophthora and enough rooted cuttings were available for inoculation from 17 of the um, parent trees, which I'm now calling clones. So obviously the offspring of each of those trees is a genetically identical replicate of that tree. So each individual parent tree that I collected cuttings from, I, I now refer to as a clone. And then we had replicate plants which we inoculated for each of those clones. In addition, um, we have a known susceptible junior, juniper clone. And this is a, a, a juniper clone that, was, that came from West Argyle. And we've used it previously and we know that it is highly susceptible to Phytophthora sedri. So we use this to sort of as a positive control to be able to measure our putatively resistant plants against. We inoculated four replicate plants per clone and then we uh, one, one, clone, one plant per clone was used as a non-inoculated control which I'll explain a little bit later and we repeated the entire experiment twice and it was carried out in a quarantine greenhouse at the Scottish um, Government Plant Health uh, Facility. Now for, we, for some of the clones that had enough rooted cuttings we were able to inoculate with two isolates but mainly we just used the one isolate of Phytophthora sedri, and that was isolate GA7 which we isolated from Glen Artney in, in 2018 and we also for those clones that had sufficient extra plants we inoculated with a, an isolate which was the very first isolate I ever got from Juniper which was TGJ3 uh, isolated from Juniper, Juniper at Teesdale in County Durham in 2011. So the top photograph shows you a picture of, of what this pathogen looks like growing on an agar plate. Um, not very interesting really, just white, uh, very slow growing. I think this is probably about seven weeks old, this, this culture. And in order to inoculate, um, we took the juniper plants and we used a cork borer to remove a, a small um, circle of bark from about two centimeters from the base of the, from the, base of the stem. And, um, and then we took a same size plug of um, the pathogen growing on the agar and we put it into the plug um, with uh, wet cotton wool and then wrapped it up in, in a couple of times, including in tin foil to protect the inoculation site. Now the um, plants were incubated in the greenhouse for six weeks and this photograph, uh, sorry, this slide shows a number of photographs of the length of the lesions, which we measured uh, the length of lesions in the phloem um, after six weeks. So for each of these photographs, I've actually, I've, I've cut away the outer bark and you can see the healthy phloem is a sort of white color and the pathogen causes the brown sort of discoloration. And so the photograph labeled A is uh, a plant where we just inoculated with plain agar. That was the negative control. So it didn't have the pathogen colonizing the agar, but was otherwise subject to exactly the same inoculation method. And you can see here a little bit of staining of the, of the wound site. That's maybe about five millimeters long. And then we move on to photograph B, and this is a horsewater clone, um, which we also inoculated, but this time with isolate GA7. And you can see here that the staining, all we got um, was just the similar level of staining to what we got in the negative control. So this appears to be quite resistant to Phytophthora sedri. And a similar story for a clone, the GA5 from, from Glen Artney. This clone here, GA13, you can see the lesion uh, was about 20, 25 millimeters long. Um, and so we would say, yes, still, I think, relatively resistant. Um, and the photographs E and F, um, these are showing clones that are highly susceptible to Phytophthora sedri, and it's, oh, they're on a different scale because the lesions are so long. The lesions were about 120 to 150 millimeters long after six weeks, and you can see the extent of the lesions and the arrows there. Um, the photograph uh, E shows a clone, another clone from Glen Artney, which appeared to be as susceptible to Phytophthora sedri as our known susceptible juniper clone from West Argyle, which is in the photograph F. So that's just showing you uh, an illustration of what we were recording. So this is the results, and I'm gonna walk you through this slide. Um, along the, the x-axis, we have all the juniper clones, basically going from the most susceptible to pretty much the most resistant. 
And on the, X, on the Y axis, we have the mean lesion length in millimeters after six weeks. The symbols in black are the control plants that were inoculated just with plain agar, not with the pathogen. And you can see really the lesion or the staining that was produced was very small, just a few millimeters. The symbols in red are the results for isolate GA7. And I'm going to really apologize for a very confusing nomenclature of our isolates. GA7 is an isolate of phytophthora and it has an unfortunately similar name to our clones, which are GAs as well. So just be aware, I apologize for that. GA7 is an isolate of the pathogen. And you can see here that um, there's a clear um, change in the response of each clone to inoculation with the pathogen with highly susceptible clones here. This is the known susceptible clone from West Argyle and you see how we have a number of clones here which I thought possibly were resistant and indeed probably turned out to be disease escapes. Whereas as we travel down here we have a number of clones that despite you know after two trials we can see that they really didn't show lesions that were any greater than the, con than the negative controls, which indicates that they have quite a high degree of, 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 sorry, of resistance. In the blue symbols are those clones that were enabled to inoculate with the second isolate, TGJ3. You can see two of them, the, they responded similarly to both uh, isolates. Um, this clone here had a little bit of differential response to the isolates. But the most interesting and quite surprising result for us here was this clone GA1, which is a tree at Glenartney, appeared to be, well, showed itself to be highly susceptible to isolate GA7, which was isolated from Glenartney, but quite resistant to isolate TGJ3, which was isolated from Teasdale. And given that we believe there's been a single genetic strain of the pathogen uh, looking at a, sort of a, a very limited number of genetic loci, um, this was quite interesting and I think, uh, yeah, I, I can talk about the implications of that uh, in a minute, but it was, it was surprising. So <clears throat> just to run through the results really, um, the, the key results, um, importantly the replicate plants of each clone presented highly consistent responses as expected because they are all genetically identical to each other, but that, that was good. We, we, we had a lot of, we had a high degree of consistency in, in, our, in our experiment. Um, and obviously, as, as I've said, the clones exhibited varying degrees of susceptibility to the pathogen. Nine of the clones do indeed appear to be largely resistant to phytophthoroostrocedry. And you've got these photographs here. This is uh, my wonderful tree GA5, which I've become very fond of at Glenartney. And these are two trees here at Horswater. Um, three clones appear to be only moderately susceptible, and four clones appear to be as susceptible as the known susceptible control. However, as I said earlier, this clone, and this is GA1 from Glenartney, this differed in its response to the two isolates. I mean, it also emphasizes the need to be testing a range of isolates when we're doing these kinds of studies. So the trial provided strong evidence that some genotypes of Juniper have natural resistance to this invasive pathogen, but these were just, this was just a clonal trial. What we don't know is whether this resistance will allow population recovery. Is it actually genetically heritable resistance? And that requires a whole different sort of set of experimentation, which we're in the stages of doing. So just to sort of illustrate this, um, obviously juniper is separate male and female um, trees, and we collect seed from the female trees. Uh, the, you know, we have the female tree, for example, my J5 from Glenartney is a female tree. Does the seed that that tree produce does that go on or the offspring then, do they, do they carry the same level of resistance that that mother tree actually has? So in order to do that, we did set up also in 2015 with colleagues from CEH and various other people who uh, were very, very helpful in collecting seed for us. Um, we've set up a juniper provenance progeny trial and we collected juniper seed from 15 populations of juniper around Britain. You can see in the photograph uh, of showing the yellow stars of where those populations are located. And at each population, we collected seed from uh, a minimum of 10 trees per site, arranging across the site, and about 50 to 100 seed per tree. And these seed are growing up at CEH across the road in the greenhouse. And we're gonna be using uh, this trial to look at heritability of uh, a range of uh, traits and resistance to phytophthora is, is gonna be included in that, but they're not quite yet ready to inoculate. 
So meanwhile, what management considerations can we offer uh, as a result of what we found so far? Um, we don't know if resistance is heritable, but in the meanwhile, I would say it's, I think, please let's start managing juniper populations to maximise natural regeneration. Let's, even though we don't know if it's heritable, let's be optimistic that it could be heritable. We know this photograph was taken at Glen Artney a couple of years ago. Glen Artney in Perthshire is one of our most heavily infected sites and you can see a lot of skeletal long dead trees here. But each of these arrows is pointing to a small regenerating uh, bush of juniper. And um, so far so good, seem to be surviving. Uh, are they resistant? We don't know yet. Um, but what I really want to emphasise is I think we really need to start changing how we think about managing juniper populations and that we need to really be avoiding planting existing juniper populations. We know, and I'm going to talk about this next, we know that Phytophthora oshocedri and other Phytophthora are present in the nursery trade and in some plant nurseries, not all, but some, and that we have a strong evidence for a link between planting, historical planting of some of these juniper sites and the onset of disease symptoms. And we haven't proven it, but we have good circumstantial evidence that suggests a strong link between, well, that planting may have been the cause of the spread of the pathogen uh, around the, sort of the geographical range of areas that it, we, we, we've been found finding it. And as we know from our clone GA1 that was had different response to two different pathogen, two different strains of the same pathogen, the introduction of more pathogen genotypes due to new plantings could put juniper populations at greater risk. So even if you say, well, Phytophthora sedri is already here, so um, it doesn't matter if we put some, you know, introduce it again. It does matter because you could be introducing a different genotype, and the, and whatever is resistant to the original genotype could be susceptible to a new genotype. So I'm going to have a break there, and I think as Neville suggested, maybe take some questions. Um, That's excellent. Thank you, Sarah. I think linking science through to what we can do in practice is absolutely vital. Uh, so thank you. And also the fact that there is hope because it's, uh, I don't know, it's just incredibly heartening when you work, walk through some juniper stands to think that, yes, there is some um, hope for this has to be good. Um, Jeanette Hall has um, come through the question, if I um unmute you Jeanette allow to talk there you go um, So I think I think I heard two words from that. Did you hear any more from that, Sarah? No, so, maybe maybe to post it. Uh, fascinating. We can answer it later. I heard fascinating, Sarah, which is a good word to cling to, isn't it? Anything that says fascinating. <laughs> the question was, uh, can we share the results? Um, I think it's fair to say that we will be publishing um, a recording of this and the presentation on the Cumbria Woodland website. And do you want to talk about the uh, publication that you're working on at the moment at this stage, Sarah? Does that relate to this as well? Well, um, I the the work that we've done has been um, submitted as a short communication to a Journal of Plant Pathology. Um, so certainly, when that's um, when that's accepted, I can certainly circulate that. And more than happy if you've got the recording of this, or I can circulate PowerPoint. That's fine to share the results. Yeah, I'm trying to get them as shared as widely as possible. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So another question coming from Paul. I'll just switch your voice on, Paul. I know Paul. Hello, Paul. <laughs> Paul, can you hear us? You... He's on mute. Paul is on mute from what I can see. Sorry. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me now? I can. Hi there, Yeah, please. yeah. Hi. I was just wondering if you had found juniper on dry, chalky sites in the south of the country, or is it strictly limited to the more wet, low pH sites in the north? So you mean Phytophthora oshocedri on the dry sites? Yes. 
the, uh, we have only identified it in soil, um, but we have not got ever, ever got an isolate. And I've visited a few of those sites and you see what could be lesions, um, but it's not 100% convincing. I think we do feel it is present on the site, but because they're drier, possibly it's not having so much of an effect. You tend also to get rust coming in quite a lot on, on junipers on those sites too. Um, but yeah, predominantly it's in the north. Um, it also does not survive temperatures in our growth rate experiments. It didn't survive temperatures above sort of 22 and a half degrees. So we know it's a definitely a cool temperature pathogen as well. But it really likes those wet, wet, um, wet sites. And actually our PhD student Flora Donald has just published a paper in forest ecology and management, um, which shows site risk factors be in water being one of them. So she was att attempting to identify factors which make sites vulnerable to the establishment of spread of the pathogen. And soil water is very, very highly linked to vulnerability. Great, hey, thank you. Thank you. If you could um, mute yourself, I'd be grateful. I'll pass on to John Tucker now. Um, I'll allow John to speak. Before I do that, I'll just say that there's stuff coming through both on the chat and also on the questions and answers icon as well. I'm pretty certain we're not going to get to cover all of this stuff today, um, but uh, I'll hand over to John. Um, thanks, Neville. Yeah, I think my question's actually already been answered. I, I live down in the southeast of England, so I was wondering um, how much environmental factors played in the susceptibility of juniper, say on the South Downs, to this Phytophthora as opposed to um, Scotland or the Cumbria. But uh, I think um, th that was answered by the, uh, through the last speaker. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, John. Um, so I'll go on to John Hodgson now, who's asked a question about prepping and sowing seeds from existing seed sources. John, you should be able to be heard now. Okay, yeah, thanks Neville. Um, just in terms of, of maximising the potential of natural regen from existing populations, which you mentioned, um, is, is the best option or one option to collect and, and stratify just the seeds and plant them out? Um, I think in particular the site I work on at Hard Knock Forest where we've got juniper, Obviously, we don't want to bring in um, different stock. Um, so, is that a is that a method that you would recommend? Well, I, th I think what I'm trying to say is perhaps not planting at all. Um, just let the juniper regenerate itself. The, the problem yeah. is, is the history of some of the planting programs has been when local seed has been collected on the site, passed over to commercial plant nurseries to raise under contract and then introduced back onto the site and subsequently having disease symptoms. So where, whereas it's good, definitely preferable to collect, to propagate but from seed, if from a genetic point of view, you want that diversity and, um, and to have that local provenance. So you're planting seed from local stock that is adapted to that site but you've still got this risk of a potential transfer of disease from a nursery back onto the site. So I'm afraid I don't really know anything at all about, about how, to, how to get juniper to naturally regenerate and I know it's, it's a difficult one but I'm, I think that's where the future lies with protecting juniper sites is, is trying to find out those factors and really hone in on what, what is stopping juniper regenerating. Okay, thanks ever so much. I'm going to allow two more questions now, I think. Um, so David Blair has a question and Emma Goldberg has a question and it's also worth looking at Gareth Browning's post in the Q&A section as well. So um, David, do you want to go first? You should be able to talk now. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, just a question. Is there a risk of moving Phytophthora ostracidri when planting other species? I'm just thinking like we're, I run a small community tree nursery on the RSPB Abernethy estate and um, we're growing montane willows and dwarf birch and also looking at maybe bringing some in from Trees for Life and Dundragon and we're just concerned about whether the compost or the soil or anything like that could, could harbour Phytophthora ostracidri spores when we're moving between sites. Yeah, that's, that's quite possible. 
<laughs> uh, one of the things we're suggesting if you are you know planting bare root stock you know rather than anything with soil around it if you can really get rid of the soil and wash the roots that will remove the possibility or at least greatly reduce the possibility of, of um, spreading the pathogen through ewer spores in soil Great, okay, thank you. Um, so handing over to Emma Goldberg now. Emma, you should be able to unmute yourself now. No, can't hear Emma. So um, <clears throat> Ian Jack has his uh, hand raised. How are we doing for time, do you think, Sarah? Just are you about halfway through presentation? Yes, I think this second section, well, yeah, definitely halfway through easily. Yeah. Okay, so we can afford to take a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Halfway through time wise. Okay. So, Ian, would you, you're unmuted. Do you want to? Thanks, Neville. Um, I just wondered if you'd done any work on the actual genetic purity of each of your sites. Do you know that they were, tr the specimens were truly native? Or had they been imported at some time in the distant past by the landowner at that time? So you're talking about the specimens that I actually collected cuttings from? Yeah, they were definitely, absolutely from that site, nat yeah. native to that site. Properly well, yeah, I, I see your question. I mean, obviously these were fairly mature trees that had been on the site for quite a long time. Mm. I have no idea of, um, I don't think it is it's not possible to test whether something is native or not simply because of what we just don't know mm. uh, enough about the genetics of juniper. Now that said, my colleagues at, at Forest Research and also together with CEH, who have got a PhD student has just started, that, who's actually going to be looking at the genetic diversity in juniper. And she did an honest project. I'm not really answering your question directly, but all I can say is all we know that within a site, the genetic diversity of juniper is very, very high. Okay. Um, that, yeah. I imagine landowners in the past would have traded seed and things like that, that's all. It's, there's, it's quite possible, but I don't think there's any genetic test to show whether something is, is indeed local provenance or whether it may have been uh, imported at some, at some stage. I understand, thank you. Excellent, thanks ever so much Ian. And I'll, I'll just, if I can summarise two points, I think there might be a problem about uh, you all seeing um, the various different posts, apologies for that, we're kind of feeling our way with this as a, as a webinar for us. So uh, the last question which covers off two points is around encouraging natural regeneration on site. So we've had two people asking about uh, how can we encourage natural regeneration and also should um, infected stuff be removed from site at the same time. So if we could cover those, Sarah, and then move on, if that sounds all right. Yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. No, just stop fiddling with the sites. You know, um, the, the more work that's done on a site, the more you've got potential for spreading it in soil. We also know, and that's work that my PhD student Flora had done and has just recently published, showing the potential for movement along animal trails and other tracks as well. So avoiding any sort of activity on the site. If it's there on the site, you're never going to get rid of it. I can tell you that. You'll never get rid of it. It will be there. And but you need to take heart that there will be, assuming your site is genetically diverse and hasn't been planted from cuttings, which is another high risk practice if you're re-establishing woodlands because we know that a normal population of juniper is very highly genetically diverse. Assume, assuming it's got that genetic diversity, let's be optimistic that there's going to be individuals who are able to overcome uh, and, and actually don't succumb to the disease. So I uh, know don't, don't do anything that requires removing. You'd have to remove the roots and soil and everything. So don't go there. I know that Teasdale's done some work and I haven't been back and I know Martin Furness is on this call so I will go back at some point to have a look but I was I was very skeptical I have to say about whether it would uh, any stop the spread uh, and, and indeed do we want to stop you know it's there for good so just live with it um, and the first question related now I've forgotten the first question again I knew it was the generation how we could encourage yeah uh, and, and, and I I am no expert I'm a pathologist I'm no expert on what 
what to do to get juniper to regenerate and there are all kinds of schools of thought and trials but i would have thought one of the best approaches um to do something similar to what uh, again phd student flora donald did when she went she went and surveyed sites intensively and um looking at um site factors in relation to the prevalence of disease symptoms so it would be possible to do a sort of again modeling where you go to a range of sites and you actually look for natural regeneration and you look at the site factors that are that are correlated with natural regeneration now flora she she did she did surveys of three different juniper sites one in the one in the sort of abernethy area uh, actually no um Cologne Bridge, a bit further south than Abernethy, but in the uh, Cairngorm range. Uh, that was one of her sites where she did an intensive survey for ostracedry and she also scored natural regeneration. She did the same in um, at the site at Blowick Fell in the Lake District and the same in Glen Artney in Perthshire. And she did score about 5% of roughly similar across all the populations, about 5% of the total area of juniper was, was what she would call young pioneering natural regeneration. So it was happening at all of those sites, but to a very low level. So what I'm saying is I think targeted studies could be done to try and identify what site factors are uh, linked with greater occurrence of natural regeneration. It, where we're seeing it on phytophthora sedry infected sites is definitely on the drier knolls. But whether the argument about levels of sheep grazing, cattle versus sheep, whether you fence, whether you don't, you know, that's not my area, I'm afraid. But maybe that's something that could be taken up by someone else in, a, in another forum. Okay, excellent. I think we do need to move on there. I, I really do like it when a scientist says, stop fiddling with things. I think that's really good, sound, practical advice. So we'll keep moving on. Just a brilliant Q&A session, which I think illustrates how engaged and interested people are in this, Sarah. So if we can carry on with the presentation, please, that would be great. Yeah, OK, so I'm now going to sort of slightly broaden the scope of what I'm talking about to include, to talk about a study that we did looking at all Phytophthora species that we could find in plant nurseries. Now this has arisen because of, um, as a forest pathologist, we've been dealing with emerging diseases of trees uh, for the last 20 years. We have Phytophthora remorum on larch, also sedri on juniper, lateralis on lost cypress and so on. And, um, and all the introductions of all of these diseases is strongly linked to the plant trade or and even proven to be, uh, have, have been introduced due to the plant trade. So this um, was what incited the Phyto Threats project, which ran from 2016 to 2019. And I've got a link to the website here. And as part of this project, it was a much broader project, but one of the work packages, which was led by David Cook at the James Hutton Institute in, in Dundee, we looked at um, Phytophthora diversity in British plant nurseries. So just to give you an overview of what we did, first of all, um, we conducted a fine scale survey and this fine scale survey involved um, the survey of 15 partner nurseries across Britain and they were operating a range of practices and we got them on board. They were happy for the science team to come twice a year and do an intensive sampling of water and roots across the nursery and definitely a range of management practices uh, operated by these nurseries. Uh, to complement this we conducted a broad scale survey and this was done with the um, great help of the plant health inspectors who go out and do statutory surveys annually of every plant nursery and as part of these annual surveys they collected extra material for us and we received samples from 118 different nurseries across Britain as part of that broad scale survey. Now our sampling on each of the nurseries was biased to finding Phytophthora, it wasn't random, we did look for, for symptoms or known Phytophthora hosts. We collected water and root samples from each nursery in triplicate and took associated metadata and, and that, that means data on what the host was, whether it had symptoms, location on the nursery, the origin of that plant, you know, where it had come from, and also a range of different nursery practices. Um, we tested a range of plant hosts and that depended on individual nursery and the symptoms that we saw. And then we analysed the samples for Phytophthora DNA. So we didn't isolate Phytophthora, we used a DNA and metabarcoding approach which enables us to see the signatures of DNA of any Phytophthora species that's present in that sample. And then we've, we aim to link uh, management to diversity and to feed these results back to nursery managers and also to help guide um, accreditation. So just a few photos of our water sampling. Uh, this is David Cook here uh, demonstrating his uh, filtration 
system. Uh, we sampled water at source, so all the water sources that we used to irrigate plants. We also sampled from drainage ditches, ponds, puddles, reservoirs, rainwater collection butts, any streams running alongside nurseries. And we also sat batches of plants, and here's some symptomatic pines. We sat in trays and we watered them to capacity, let the water flow through, left them for half an hour, and then filtered the water. The idea being that any phytophthora propagules that are in the, the compost or the soil in the, in the pots would be washed out and flushed out into the water. So the phytophthora propagules would then collect on a filter and the filter is placed in a buffer and the DNA is extracted from the filters and the buffers. We also sampled roots um, from the same batches of plants that we did the water flow through test. Uh, and we also sampled fine roots from other batches of plants, including symptomatic and hints, symptomatic hosts. And every single nursery has its plant dump. Um, and we sampled roots from dumped plants as well. You can see here, David foraging in the plant dump. So this, the test that we do for Phytophthora is a two-stage process. And the first stage is simply tells us, it's a PCR test that simply tells us, is Phytophthora present? Is any species of Phytophthora present in the sample or not? So over the three years, we conducted four to five visits over our 15 partner nurseries. We collected around 3,000 samples from about 150 different host plant species. And over all our samples, roughly, I would say about 50% of the samples were positive for Phytophthora, sort of across the board. And you can see here David's slide, which shows just over 40% of root samples were positive for Phytophthora. And here a slightly higher percentage of water samples were, phy were Phytophthora positive. <clears throat> You'll be interested to see, and this slide shows the top 24 host genera that were sampled across the nurseries out of 150 species. And I don't know if it was my enthusiasm for looking for juniper, but the, by far the most commonly sampled host was in fact juniper. And it also illustrates just how important juniper is in the plant trade and is grown by many and produced by many nurseries. Now this slide uh, illustrates the differences among the 15 partner nurseries. And each of our nurseries is anonymous. We don't tell you obviously which nursery it is. But what you can see here, each bar shows the percentage of samples collected from that nursery that were actually positive for Phytophthora on the fine scale survey. So you can see this nursery here has about 20% of its samples were positive for Phytophthora and they range up to close to 70% of samples at this particular nursery were found to be positive for Phytophthora. And knowing the nurseries, and we could say that this was definitely linked to observed management practice at the time of sampling. And this is another slide that David produced out of um, 800 samples that had been, um, so these were samples that were positive for Phytophthora that were then run through metabarcoding process to tell us which species were present in the sample. And this just shows you that there's a number of Phytophthoras, and I won't, I won't go into them, but there's a number that do come up very commonly um, across the samples. Phytophthora oshocedri sort of sits here in terms of the frequency of abundance across the samples that we collected. But we, collect, we found so far 51 Phytophthora species. We still have quite a, we've still got a couple of plates waiting in the sequencing lab uh, since March. Um, we haven't been able to get to, so we are still awaiting data. Um, and again, this slide shows along the x-axis of the 15 different partner nurseries that we sampled. And on the y-axis, this is showing you the um, number of samples in which a particular Phytophthora species was found. So each of the different coloured bars reflects a different Phytophthora species. And it's just showing you how variable across nurseries it, it, it was in terms of the diversity and abundance of Phytophthora. So you can see this nursery number one, nursery number six, seven, nine in particular, have a very high abundance and diversity of Phytophthora that we found. Whereas nursery here, NO4 and NO8, uh, very low levels of Phytophthora, very low abundance, and clearly linked to management practice. N008 was a particularly high biosecurity nursery and operated what we would call to be pretty optimal practice. So it was really good to have this range of nurseries because it was in a way sort of slightly beyond our control in terms of which nurseries would agree to be you know, sampled in this way. And so it enabled us to test a range of different management practices. So in terms of the juniper results so far, um, 95%, sorry, 95, not 
95 of the juniper samples tested, uh, have tested positive for phytophthora. And okay, we're concerned about phytophthora ostracedri, but I should also say that we found 15 different phytophthora species associated with juniper in nurseries. And for those of you that are familiar with phytophthora species, some of the common species that we found included phytophthora cinnamomai, which is a very broad host range, very damaging species. Phytophthora cryptogea, which you often find in roots, um, particularly I'll say in juniper, uh, Phytophthora cactorum and Phytophthora gonopodioides. And so we know that a number of them are particularly damaging to trees as well. We found Phytophthora DNA at five nurseries so far, and the hosts predominantly juniper, but we also found Phytophthora ostracedri DNA associated with Lawson cypress. And, and interestingly, one finding in roots of cherry laurel, which we think may have been contamination of the soil. And just want to illustrate a point again here. I mean, this is one of our partner nurseries we went to, and this is the nursery manager's garden, which had a mature juniper growing in it. And of course, I spotted this right away, um, looking a bit off colour. And the juniper um, was subsequently found to be infected with Phytophthora ostracedri and removed by the, by the manager. But you'll see the juniper is actually slightly uphill of a polytunnel, which was growing juniper for landscaping schemes. And the juniper subsequently also the young juniper growing for landscaping schemes was found to be phytophthora ostracedri positive. Just a couple of slides illustrating the diversity of phytophthoras we were finding in some samples. So some nurseries use river, direct river extraction for water plants and we can see here that's very highly risky. Um, we've got this water sample has eight known phytophthora species and one unknown phytophthora species that we found in that, in that one sample. But the, the prize really goes to the puddles. Um, this is a single puddle sample was found to have 12 known Phytophthora species, including Phytophthora ostracedri, and one unknown Phytophthora species. And this particular puddle was a collection point uh, where the water just ran down and collected from a whole range of different hosts that were sitting on, on, on the ground. Um, so puddles and poor drainage is, is high risk in terms of spreading species. But another finding is the risk of uh, implanting schemes here. And I just want to use an example of um, sessile oak, which was intended for a restoration scheme. So similar to what's been done to juniper in the past, the, the seed of the oak was collected from this vulnerable site and it was planted and sent across to a commercial plant nursery who grew it up and uh, it was destined for being planted out at the same site. And uh, it was found to be, um, have DNA of Phytophthora quercina, which is an oak infecting Phytophthora which appeared to be really prevalent on oaks that we found in nurseries. I think there was only one or two oak samples that did not have, have Phytophthora quercina. So the survey has highlighted the risk of disease introduction and spread through supplementary planting of existing woodland. Um, and I think that there are certainly risks there which really now really do need to be taken into consideration. And that is, if your woodland manages, you need to really put biosecurity in the heart of woodland management. It's not about just um, getting funding and, and putting plants in and numbers, and it's not a numbers game, it's about putting, it's about, it's about not make, not introducing disease into that woodland. So you need to ask the question, do you really need to plant? If it's, a, and if it's an existing woodland, ask yourself, why is it not naturally regenerating? I'm afraid I can't answer those questions. Ecologists can or <laughs> managers can, um, but I think that's the way you need to go. Planting on otherwise bare ground is less risky. So if you need to plant those sites, um, there are certain key biosecurity considerations that you need to take into account. And I've actually just produced this flyer here, which we are hoping will be completed next week. And I know Carrie's going to circulate this to everyone who's attending this meeting. And it's a two-sided flyer running through some key biosecurity considerations uh, when you're procuring planting contracts. So that, you know, some key questions to ask is where does the stock come from? Is it, is it locally produced stock? Is it grown from seed on site? Has any of it been imported? Or if it's locally grown from local seed on the site and it's been grown up by a nursery in the UK or in wherever in your local area, does that same nursery import plants? Uh, because if they do, then that is risky. Also very important to visit your grower and ask about the water source. You know, if they're using borehole water or mains water, that's, that's, that's better. If they're using rivers, if they're extracting from reservoirs, is the water treated to kill microorganisms? Just if your producer 
imports plants? Do they have a quarantine holding area for imported plants? What's the drainage like at the nursery? Are there puddles? Is there, is there excess watering going on? So you've just got this runoff and, and, and puddle, puddling. How do they dispose of their plants? Do they have plant dumps which are located quite close to the growing stock? That's quite, that's risky. Look around at the surroundings of the nursery. Are there trees that are looking, that are planted in the, in the area or windbreaks are looking off colour? We've seen already a couple of nurseries where I found Lawson cypress with Phytophthora lateralis infected around a nursery site. Also, look at the general nursery hygiene. Um, do they use, or do they have in disinfectant stations? Do they, do they reuse pots? Um, if they do, do they disinfect the pots? What's the what potting mix do they use? I've talked, sorry, I skipped the growing media, but the growing media is really important. And I've got some concerns about the increasing use of peat free growing media, which of course is ecologically better, but still contains local authority green waste, chopped bark, also coir, which is introduced directly from the tropics uh, <laughs> and is apparently absolutely fine. Uh, according uh, to the producers of coir, I have some questions. I think that uh, we've got a project actually we were hoping to start this year but now with um, the things that have happened over the last three months it's going to be deferred to next year but we'll be looking at the risk of peat-free copping sorry peat-free potting mixes composts in terms of phytophthora spread. Um, is the weed free is there lots of weeds around or is it generally clean so look at the surrounding you know general nursery hygiene and you know what level of plant health knowledge is there at the nursery does the nursery employ have someone who is aware and is looking out for the health of the plants on, on, on site. And then my final slide is, do you consider supporting accreditation? So we know our nursery sampling data that are highlighting the riskiest management practices, but some good news is that the HTA together with the government and industry are developing and trialing a plant healthy certification scheme. And you can go to the site here. Um, and this is being rolled out now. It was delayed because of coronavirus, but now it's being rolled out and there are a number of nurseries which are coming on board for, for certification as being part of that scheme. And to be part of that scheme, they have to adhere to a, a, a great number of, of biosecurity practices. So really important if you're procuring plants for planting schemes, strongly consider supporting growers who are part of this scheme or are intending to join. Uh, but my take home message I'm hoping uh, as a pathologist uh, is a natural regeneration of existing woodland is far preferable to planting. And I'm going to finish there with this uh, slide taken at Hawes Water in the Lake District. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, Sarah. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if anybody has anything. Um, are there any hands raised? been a couple of questions in the chat which have answered themselves as we've gone along. So I think what I'll do is just because of the time is I'll bring the session to a close. I just I suppose I want to say forest research fan base hopefully it's just increased a little bit more just that need for professionals to to understand the latest information and the best information has to be great and you link that to the government's aspiration in terms of planting targets, etc. And you just think there are so many more people that we need to infect with stuff that's in your head and many of the others in uh, in FR, Sarah. So thanks ever so much. Um, you know, I just think the way that we um, help people think about this has stuff has to be vital. So really good. I have a question for everybody, a simple poll. Now, Cumbria Woodlands, and you should, um, are keen to do more of this stuff, okay? Um, but it comes down to money, really. It takes us quite a bit of time to pull this sort of stuff together. So one person's voted so far, I see, and they're prepared to pay now. Luckily, there is an anonymous poll, but it, it would just, if people are willing to pay a bit for this, it's good for us just to engage willingness to pay for this, because then it would mean we could put on more of these things more regularly. So, um, wow, it's fact, can you see this out there? Can you see the results of this, Sarah, or not? Can you just see the questions? I, all I can see is the question. Okay. It's still rising quickly, so I'm just going to stick with it. 
another. I, I don't. I get paid already, right? <laughs> so I don't. I'm quite happy with my pay, but certainly Neville and Carrie have been put, are busy putting this together. So uh, yeah, <laughs> support Cumbria Woodlands. <laughs> <laughs> Still rising, so we're up to 50, 50 responses now. I'll publish the response in a second, that's why I'm just holding on. <laughs> Payment. Yeah, well, well, if we're talking about the general big boost for um, you know, planting uh, for climate change mitigation, we really are trying to get the message out about, about how you procure your plants and supporting nurseries that really are doing a good job, because I, I don't want to put a downer on nurseries, there are some nurseries who are really doing well. And really important that that they're supported. So I think that just that illustrates that people are willing to pay, which is good. Uh, I'm completely with you about the nurseries thing. It just it's that whole think about what you're doing. So with that, uh, I think I'd like to say thanks ever so much, Sarah. Brilliant. You know, it's just been shown through the questions how much people are interested in it and the attendance that people are interested, engaged and keen to discuss more. We will be circulating uh, information following on from this. So thanks ever so much to you, Sarah. Also, thanks ever so much to Carrie for pulling it all together. There's loads of thanks coming through on the questions and comments stuff. So with that, thanks to all friends, old and new. Okay, Cheers. thank you. Goodbye. Bye.